I do. I like Okay, we are back live here in Silicon Valley, California. We're at Brocade headquarters for the Cube, SiliconAngle.tv special broadcast for Brocade's Technology and Analyst Day. I'm John Furrier, founder of SiliconAngle.com, SiliconAngle.tv, joined with my co-host, Stu Miniman, analyst at Wikibon.org. And uh, we are here with Josh Snowhorn, Cyber, Cyrus One, Vice President and General Manager. Welcome to the Cube. Thank you. You guys are going IPO. Little spin out story, we can't really talk about it because you're in a quiet period, but we can talk about tech. Yes, absolutely. So, first, uh, tell us why you're here at Brocade, and we can go into some of the really cool stuff you guys are working on in terms of com computation, big data, bigger than big, uh, and so on and so forth. Sure, well, I was invited to come to Brocade to talk about what we're doing in the technology side. Um, we've chosen you guys as the vendor for. Uh, for our uh, seismic internet I don't exchange work for platform. I'm no. sorry, chosen brocade, chosen brocade for the seismic internet exchange platform. <laughs> uh, and we're pretty excited about what they're doing for us. We have some big data applications at SiliconANGLE you might be a customer for uh, <laughs> for us. Um, so let's talk about uh, what you guys are doing. What what technically do you have going on that you need to push the envelope on, on network performance? Well, we're the largest provider of data center services to the oil and gas sector. So um, if you think about Chevron or Schlumberger or BP, PGS, um, Halliburton, those kind of guys are doing seismic processing and oil and gas research around the world. And they take all that, all that data on tape and bring it back to our data center to process it or their own data center. And uh, it's really kind of old school in the way they do things. We're trying to create a paradigm shift in the way they actually exchange data where they can do it in the metro. We're offering it at no cost so they can actually scale up and do hot, hot seismic processing at 10 gig or 100 gig levels. Oil and gas is one of those verticals that where big data is big because a lot of computation, high performance computing, simulation, a yeah. lot of that kind of stuff with the active data. Yeah. And so that having active data requires you to have data in the network, right? Absolutely. Not on tape. Absolutely. <laughs> Low latency. I, the biggest reason for tape was security. They were, uh, you know, that's, that represents trillions of dollars in market cap for these guys. So where are, where is the oil, where is the oil and gas uh, industry relative to, you know, putting them into a bucket, early adopter, fast follower, laggard, in terms of tech? Because um, most people don't think oil and gas is kind of being on the cutting edge of tech, but when reality, there seems to be a lot of demand there on the big data side we've been hearing. So share your opinion on what's happening in that sector. I, I think they're early adopters, actually. They, they certainly are not limited by capital. Um, their ability to actually go and deploy the latest uh, next generation hardware. They use water-cooled uh, um, Cray supercomputing environments. They are buying the most expensive, fastest gear they can. But that networking piece was always something that was always missing, and they never really wanted to manage it. That's why we're doing it, take away that headache. So what's their biggest concerns right now? Is it just pure traffic? Pure traffic. You're talking about exabyte scales of data right now, and growing. Um, it is so massive. Uh, you know, when these guys come in and they do seismic processing, they have a two end power environment with lots of one end on the processing side and, and really it's about megawatt scale classes of, of expansion and deploying this hardware and interconnecting it all. Yeah, so, so, so Josh, uh, Brocade's announcement today talked a lot about scalability and bandwidth. So yes. um, have you touched any of the new products that they have here or you know, what's your experience been with Brocade on the Ethernet side? I have, um, we've actually chosen the MLX E platform on okay. the MLX32 or MLX16. Yep. Um, we're looking at uh, our 10 gig density on the MLX32E uh, is 768 10 gig ports per chassis. That is just absolutely massive. And uh, because we're giving away our ports, uh, it's really important for us to have that low cost per port metric and great performance. And the fact that they're so big in the internet exchange market, they have great success around the world, we felt comfortable with okay, it. Okay, so a uh, two part question. One is, you know, what, what's your growth pattern look like? And one of the things that at least we found in the customers that are using Brocade, especially looking at that cost per port, is that Brocade's financing the way that they actually deploy and can kind of just, it's, it's, you only pay for what you use. And yeah. can grow with that uh, has been uh, kind of an intriguing model. Uh, so, you know, what, what, what's your growth and are you, are you using some of those brocade financing uh, uh, options to you know, make it more cost effective for you? Uh, we d I'll start with the second question yep. first. Uh, we did not finance it. Okay. Uh, we, we're fortunate enough to be capital uh, uh, rich enough to be able to actually go and deploy what we wanted to deploy. I think on the, uh, the growth, it, it's sort of a wait and see kind of thing, but we're not actually doing internet traffic per se. None of the top 50 web properties are our customers. Doesn't mean they won't be now but, or later, but 
right now that seismic processing side, we have over 500 customers, all of them will get ports right away, all for free, so I expect that to scale rather quickly, they'll get very embedded with it. Okay, C can you walk us through, uh, uh, you know, most oil and gas environments, kind of single site, maybe doing metro, you know, what, what, what's the, the breadth and scope of your environment, what, do, what are you doing different than some of your peers? On the networking side, yeah, you mean? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, there is no peer on the networking side for what we're doing, okay. it, it literally doesn't exist. Yeah. Um, seismic processing is really a single site thing, take your tapes, move it by armored vehicle, and do what you need to do and take you know, hold on to that data. They keep it incredibly secure because of the value of it. Um, what we're doing differently is offering it for free and lighting up building to building within the metro. In addition, putting a brocade or an Infinera box combined into their data center. So if their data center is full, they can do all their scaling back into ours. Oh, so what was the, the, you said brocade or it was Infinera? Infinera. Oh, Infinera. Is, is the I optical, don't know that's the optical platform we're using okay. to light the metro, and that's click okay. and build terabit scale. Uh, optical networking. Okay, and so you've moved off tape. What's your storage environment look like then? Well, we don't have a storage environment. It's okay. their storage environment. Ah. We offer space power and cross connects, nothing else. Okay. So that's uh, all their hardware. Great. Mm -hmm. So my big thing about big data right now is, is that obviously it's early. Um, and oil and gas and other verticals like uh, obviously financial and seeing some you know, web and government uh, adopting it. You know, they're doing the latest and greatest. Explain to the folks out there what people Explain to the folks who might not understand what big data means, who might see it as more of a kind of a generic marketing word. In your experience, no. what do you think uh, that people should know about big data? Uh, big data, what big data really requires is are, are thousands and thousands of servers and completely new networked environment to interconnect all of that, and 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 really. You know, hundreds and hundreds of megawatts of power and big data centers actually house it all. The, the, the data could be any, in our case it's oil and gas, so it's seismic data. It's, these guys are dragging sonar arrays or putting boomer machines in and trying to find um, shale gas or, or oil underneath the uh, pre-salt layer in Rio de Janeiro, things like that. And all of that. And you're also going to run simulations as well, right? It's simulations. It's supercomputing environments, but but way beyond what the universities and things like that are doing. And and obviously with no funding issues, so it changes everything. All right. So talk about like the insights that big data can provide, because one of the things that's really interesting about big data is the schema definitions, like in data warehousing and business intelligence systems, would require you know really hardcore databases, mm -hmm. you know rows and columns well defined. But with big data, you don't necessarily have that. Um, what's your experience with dealing with those databases out there, the NoSQL? Do you guys have any experience with that? We, we aren't in the database side, so I, it, while, while our customers all do that, we simply, they tell us how much power they need, how much space they need, we make sure we cool it, make sure the connectivity's there, that's it. Okay, so maybe that's a different question around big data, because this is one that always comes up is, okay, I got data and I'm putting it in all, every, all different places on commodity, industry standard hardware, uh, I got to move it across the network. So you mentioned network issues. What are you seeing that was uh, just a few years ago, say five years ago, What's changed since five years to now in terms of networking where there's some significant differences with some of these technologies? I, I think what you're seeing on the networking side, in the metro you're seeing um, 100 gig absorption and, and, and certainly that's really a big driver. Uh, even 10 gig, even lag 10 gig linking together really didn't cut it. 100 gig is really the next step up. Um, nationally, you have just a couple of backbones really going to 100 gig now and it's going to become a cost factor. I think uh, uh, as that cost starts getting driven down just like internet pricing has been driven down, you're going to start to see a lot of substantial you, growth have that you way. Been seeing, have you been seeing, um, we've been hearing some rumblings that there's no more bandwidth left in like Atlanta. Uh, met these major metros are kind of saturated with constraints. Sure. Have you seen any of that? No, I, 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 I don't think that's really true. I think people can light lambdas and <laughs> there's lots of fiber in the ground or people, you know, if we'll get to the point where people might start digging again or can't squeeze any more down the fibers, that'll be interesting because they'll have to raise a lot of billions of dollars to redeploy. So, but, so, so, yeah. so Josh, b before you joined your, your current role, you were at Terramark. Yes. My understanding, you were actually instrumental in the building of the NAP of Americas. Yes, it was. Uh, actually, if I, I know the folks watching can't see it, but Wikibon last year did an infographic on five of the largest data centers and NAP of the Americas was the third largest data center in the country yes. at that point. Um, you know, for networking is critical, but you know, power and, and density is, is one of the biggest challenges we see from you know, the, the big data centers. So can you talk to us a little bit about what you're seeing in that space, you know, what you learned at Napa of the Americas that you're taking into your new role? Sure, well Napa of the Americas was interesting. You know, that, was a, that was a hub environment. You had a 750,000 square foot data center with all the undersea cables coming in. And it was an international handoff, handled about 95% of all the traffic between North and South America currently owned by Verizon, they've acquired Terramark. Yeah. Um, it, it, what's limiting down there is really the scale of the building in a downtown environment and be able to get power to it. 
um, where, where you see data centers going now are where there's low energy costs and where you can actually get network out to it. it the network became the non-issue. People are willing to purchase network out to areas where the power costs are lower and we can get lower PUEs. Uh, we're building a data center in Phoenix where you have the dry desert environment. Using evaporative technology, we can get a PUE of about a 1.2. Miami, you're certainly not doing that. So it really, it's really uh, changing the world where people are actually deploying their big environments. Yeah, and at least in Phoenix, you don't have the lightning strikes as much as you had in Miami. No, we have the crazy dust storms there. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Josh Nohorn with um, soon to be public. Uh, what's the es estimated IPO? Uh, well, we're waiting for tax rulings and things like that uh, from the IRS and certainly with the SEC, but uh, sometime soon is Cyrus, a good example. Cyrus One, explain the story for the folks out there real quick. We have a couple minutes left. Sure, Cyrus One is, uh, was acquired by Cincinnati Bell a couple of years ago to become uh, uh, really their data center division, and they merged all the assets from Cincinnati Bell into Cyrus One and put a lot of capital in to expand. Um, and they want to realize the benefits of that and all that investment and, and grow that out now, so that's what they're working on now. So it's a spin out. It's a spin out, absolutely. Okay, it's a spin out. Okay, great. Um, final question, uh, what do you see as the future of the data center? Um, because you work with a lot of different data centers, you understand data centers. The big talk is software-defined data center. That's the, that's the destination for them on the, on the roadmap of network virtualization, software-defined networks, but ultimately the bigger play for a lot of these vendors is to make it really a software-defined data center. Absolutely. Um, and there's a lot of issues involved, footprint, energy, <laughs> you know, uh, SDNs, automation, all of the above. So just give us your vision of the future data center. What, what needs to happen in, in the effort for CIOs to re-architect? Well, I, I mean, the first thing you have to think about in the data center side is, is quit trying to build little buildings and then getting full and trying to squeeze more gear in there. The fact is everything's virtualized and everybody's squeezing every little bit of CPU out of every single server. So now you come to the point of looking at modularity within your footprint of where you're going. Build very large data centers with massive amounts of energy, massive amounts of cooling. But, but what you need to look at is every single data, data center is not just power and cooling, it's an ecosystem. And if you don't get your parties interconnecting within those environments, you're going to have failure. Parties so, being, excuse which me? Which parties? Uh, parties could be energy guys interconnecting, um, could be content players connecting to eyeballs, provide you know cloud guys selling services to those people within your data center. The cloud. So a little bit of orchestration amongst the different uh, constituents. Absolutely. If you will. And that, that's where the fabric technology comes into play. You just interconnect them and make it as automated as possible. So that's kind of where the policy stuff comes in. Yeah. That's where the software. You'll be hearing a lot about software-led infrastructures from SiliconANGLE Wikibon over the next year. Um, and stay tuned for some some uh, really compelling research soon to be announced by Wikibon on this. Josh, thanks for coming on theCUBE. We'll be right back with our next guest after this short break. Thank you.